rid of the mutilating marks, as some 18th and 19th century collectors viewed the annotations. This is pretty much um, something they would call now as a ruined or a graffiti book that's often avoided by students with the U sticker in the college bookstore. If we can assume that most of Sherman's 40% did indeed have user marks, which is what I have found to be the case, as I can find at least some remaining pen flick or the end of a letter just on the edge of a page, only a bit of a letter creeping onto a page, even if they do cut it. So it just shows something was there, hence why they were trying to get rid of it. So if you add 40% to 20%, it makes it more like 60% probably did have annotation, which is closer to the number I am finding. And closer also to half So what can we learn from examining these user marks in English history? I cannot understate the importance of examining an entire genre, or at least a large corpus, when looking at marginalia, as seen with the book 2,000 books that Heather Jackson analyzed in her study called Marginalia, Owen Gingrich's three-decade study, I'm not there yet, of all 600 extant copies of Copernicus's On the Revolution of the Heavenly Spheres, or even Heidi, Heidi Hackle's attempt it's only when you reach this numerical level of analysis that it begins to bring out all types of connections, themes, and statistics not viewable in the usual marginalia studies of one to about a dozen works. I'm aiming to at least reach, hopefully, 70 to 100 by the time I'm done, and so far have looked at 49 books and three um, late 15th century manuscripts in multiple archives in order to overcome the collection uh, nuances that occur, such as certain donors in some archives like to have clean copies, so if you only looked at one place, you might say, oh, there's no annotations. But if you look at another archive, some of the first provenance, so there's you know, some well-documented books, um, large folios, or maybe early um, incunables. So looking at multiple archives helps even out these changes rather than just focusing on one archive. This enables me to begin establishing some patterns on the frequency and method of readers' annotations in the English history genre. As my own research has found, actually a little bit higher, 80% of user annotation of some type, um, which I have here in this chart. A number I expect it to still change uh, some over the next year as I continue to visit more archives. Um, I would also like to point out, if you're gonna sit here and do math because you get bored, um, that I do know that the numbers here of the number of different instances of handwriting within a book are not going to add up to that book because there are quite commonly multiple hands within one book, different readers over time using the same book. However, in the low amount of marginalia, sometimes the only evidence of readers changing over time is the ownership marks in the front cover, so title page sometimes, or the flyleaf, or even the name writing practice on a random page within the text. And in the cases where the book is largely underlined rather than filled with the textual marginalia, if one or more of those few pieces of marginalia that do show up happen to be a math problem, which some people may look at now, of calculating the differences in time within the historical narratives, it can actually provide an exact window of when the reader was writing. I have found so far. Um, it might be something easy to overlook if you're looking through a book like, oh, some <coughs> problems inside. But what it shows here is 1658 and 1576, subtracting for the difference of 82, and here's 1602 and 1537, difference of 65 years. The two top numbers show exactly when the reader is because these bottom numbers are right in context with what's happening on the page. Here, the instance is they're trying to figure out how many years it's been since Colin should have updated his chronicle because it's on the title page and they've underlined. I cropped it so it would fit, but on the rest of the page over here, it shows them underlining the date in the title, like it's been 1576 when Colin should have printed this. So they're trying to figure out how old this book is. And over here, they're trying to figure out how many years it's been since Henry VIII died. For the method of user marks, the following um, show the most types, the most common types, but of course there's always a few unusual, but these are the most common top ones we've seen. Uh, butcher, butcher books, uh, kind of like our modern uh, number signs. Crosses, sometimes they're for fixed, like little plus sign looking, and sometimes they're actually look more like a cross with very long extended lines. Little short, or sometimes just long lines, dashes pointing to things in the text lines down the sides of paragraphs or hot cross bun marks, um, other marks, check marks. And here's the famous manicules, also called fists sometimes. 
divided by the printer. So all different interactions with the text. The use of similar markings, and I keep finding this in different books every time I look, shows a sort of cultural intertextuality uh, for the methods used to mark a book. Um, moreover, reader annotations have happened for the same event or historical figure, different readers, across different chronicles, pointing to another type of cultural intertextuality in which certain items are important to multiple readers during this era. These, these items probably would have been ignored by modern readers just reading a plain, clean copy, such as in the reign of Henry V in 1128, when men, according to the text, you know, began to grow their hair longer, contending with women on having a similar length or perhaps shorter. Or in 1549, another random little incident, uh, when Francis Duffield, a daughter, uh, struck the mayor, William Hurst, in the face for arresting her father. So once again, one of the issues is marginalia has been cut off, but you can see the march. And I've had to zoom in to try to help you see the marginalia, but this whole section of the narrative is talking about how Francis uh, struck the mayor. So it's little things that we might just skim over to look at the big events that readers from this era actually were interested in. Some of the annotation patterns I have found uh, cover frequent notation of warfare, rebellions, religion, uh, sometimes noticeably focusing on the Reformation and the impact it was having, uh, sometimes also very determinedly trying to scratch out or ink out the Pope's name, coinage, uh, famine, the price of goods, and as usual, politics such as the actions of royals, nobles, and mayors. However, women too have a place as another one of the categories readers regularly noted, as seen here in this chart. Most of these notations were on English, sometimes on Scottish women, and even a few instances of royal women uh, from Germany, France, and Bohemia. The overwhelming majority of non-Tudor royal women were queens, but there are four instances of princesses being noted for their marriage into the English royal family, or in the instance of Princess Mary Jane's sixth daughter, her death at the age of two in among the Tudor era of royal women, so that would be getting closer to when the actual 16th and 17th century handwriting is occurring, also have a different breakdown of the number of instances they get with notations, sometimes marginalia, sometimes underlining, sometimes little check marks. By analyzing all of these user marks, even if no ownership or name practices happens to occur to give you an idea of who's doing it, Something can also still be determined about the reader, even if there's no name, particularly when comparing these larger statistical results to know just you know, who is the most common to see noted. Because as this chart shows, it's common to at least have one of Henry VIII's wives, and it is normal. It's common to have at least one of them noted in any given chronicle you're looking at. And even more likely for it to be one of the first two wives, given they're tied together because divorce occurred while else was marriage. It's also the Reformation starting in England. Other common notes are also King Edward VI first, probably J.C. Moore, King Elizabeth's birth, and Queen Mary Stuart's execution. And sometimes readers will also note Tudor queens right up until the reign of the current monarch, probably when they are writing, and then it just suddenly goes dark. Whether Mary or Elizabeth. Perhaps it's tempting to avoid to show what they think about a female ruler. When reversing this analysis by applying the aggregate numbers back to individual instances inside of a book, other things start becoming apparent. For example, in a copy of Thomas Cooper's Chronicle at Columbia University, it shows a reader that has been interested in all six wives of Henry VIII, something that is very unique because it's normally not all six that are noted, just a few. On the other hand, a copy of John Stowe's abridgment of the Chronicles is also at Columbia, shows a reader who at first seems to be regularly marking strange events such as you know, hail storms uh, coming that have like faces on the hail, you know, uh, two-headed cows being born, that sort of strange event, um, misbehaving women uh, such as Empress Matilda, daughter of Henry I, who is the protagonist against King Stephen in the period known as the Anarchy. Uh, Queen Isabella of France is also commonly noted in books. And the 15th century Duchess of Gloucester, Eleanor Cobham, who was charged with necromancy, is also commonly noted. 
However, inside of Stowe's abridgment that the Columbia, when notation fit to the Tudor era, the focus on strange events and monstrous creatures continued, if not even increasing 